Stories of Great Christians. From its radio studios in Chicago, the Moody Bible Institute greets its friends everywhere with Chapter 4 in the transcribed story of Florence Nightingale, The Lady with the Lamb. Dr. Fowler, a friend of Florence Nightingale's family, was head of what was known as the Salisbury Infirmary. Since this infirmary was only a few miles from the Nightingale's estate and had rather a good name, Florence hoped she might be allowed to go there and train as a nurse. But when she mentioned the idea to her mother, Mrs. Nightingale was horrified. Moreover, Dr. and Mrs. Fowler themselves threw cold water on the notion. Florence was dismayed. Nevertheless, she knew God had called her to be a nurse. And after a discreet interval, she tried talking over her plans with Father. Florence, hasn't your mother told you that the Fowlers have definitely turned thumbs down? Yes, but Papa, why can't I engage in a work or a profession? I don't want to live out my life doing nothing. I want to accomplish something. Oh, I understand, Flo. But after doing a little investigating, I can see no practical possibility for you in nursing. Why don't you write? Several people have told me that you have real talent along that line. But I want to be a nurse, Papa. Writing is a secluded sort of occupation. I want to engage in the fight for survival, not just write about it. But what is there about hospitals that attract you? It's the poor. When they get sick, they almost always die. Often just from lack of care. But the place where the care is worst of all is in the hospitals. Think for a moment. What kind of people are you wasting your sympathy on? What kind of patients do you see in most hospitals? Drunkards picked up on the streets, roving wanderers with no homes to go to? But they have souls, Papa. And God cares for them. Shouldn't they have a chance to? Certainly. But are they going to get it in a hospital? My dear Flo, most hospitals reek so that anyone going into them for the first time is likely to get sick to his stomach, and that's no exaggeration. I agree, Papa. I've seen them. Hundreds of them. And not in England only, but abroad. They're all rotten. The floors and walls are saturated with impurity. They get covered with a filthy green scum that seems to grow on them. Then, if you know they're like that, so do I've seen a nurse put a sick man into the very bed that a corpse had just been taken out of. It didn't seem to matter that he died of some frightful, contagious disease and that she didn't bother to do so much as change the sheets to say nothing of the sodden old mattress. And that's the sort of place you want to go into? Yes, Papa. With the determination God helping me to change it. Well, Flo, you've never been so sheltered that you haven't had plenty of opportunity to see the misery of the world. And your mother and I are charitably inclined... So that if the stench and filth were the only objectionable part... I know part, what you're going to say. After all, you are a young lady, my dear. I'd be insane to consider letting you associate with the low, immoral, drunken women who earn a living by nursing. Then there's the matter of training, too, you know. And no place to train, absolutely no place. The Fowlers wouldn't There's a be better it. place than the Fowlers. It's a German institute at Kaiserworth. And I've set my heart on going there. Sometimes it seems as if my heart were there already. Surely someday I can be there in body, too. Kaiserworth? What sort of place is this institution? It's a Protestant home and hospital where young ladies are trained to become professional nursing women. Have you looked into it carefully? I have. No one could possibly object to it, Papa. Chevalier Bunsen sent me the information about it, and if he approves, you know it must be all right. Chevalier Bunsen? The one who's to be made a baron soon? yes. It's a deeply religious group, and the discipline and supervision of nurses is so strict there can be no question of morals. Mm, I say, you're suggesting something now that will require a great deal of thought and investigation, Flo. Don't plan on anything like that for at least a year or two, anyway. In the meantime, your mother wants you to help her. She's worked very hard to get together the sort of people you should be happy to but associate... But, Papa, please, I must have work to do. Yes, we shall see, my dear, we shall see. Please, be patient, Flo. We'll wait and talk it over a little. William, 
dear, about Flo. You must have noticed how unhappy she's been. Of course I have. I know what's wrong, too. Oh, yes, it's that, that nursing. Always wanting to be a nurse. Well, that's the problem in general. Specifically, she wants to go to some German hospital where young ladies are trained. A rigidly supervised place, rather on the order of a convent, it seems. Only this is a Protestant institution. Florence gets the oddest notions. I'm not so sure that this is an odd notion. After all, it was Chevalier Bunsen who recommended the place to her. And it sounds perfectly respectable. That's all very well. Do you want her to prepare to be a nurse? After she gets the training, what will she do with it? <laughs> well taken, Fanny. You do have a point there. She can't always live abroad, and here in England there's not a single hospital that we could risk letting her enter. She's so eager to do it, so devoted to the poor. And have we educated and trained a daughter for this? To have her spend her life in those stinking dens they call hospitals? No, William. We must protect Florence from herself. You're right, of course, Fanny. But how are we going to get her mind off all this? Right now, I don't know. Wait. You have a plan? Yes. Selina Bracebridge and her husband were here the other night and talked about going to Rome. It seemed to me that Selina was hinting that Flo be allowed to travel with them. Really? That's good. If she mentions it again, you may be sure she'll have a sympathetic listener. <laughs> So for a time the argument languished. Rome it was. The clothes Florence would take, the books she'd read, the sights she'd see. All was talked over, reviewed in conference, and decided on by vote. Florence said all the goodbyes, kissed all the aunts and cousins, and was all the while trying to comfort Parthy, who was pale and tragic as though a funeral were in the offing. Rome was a delight. And under its spell, the vision of broken bodies and tortured faces was just for a little while forgotten. December 15th was my red-letter day. Think of it. I was alone in the Sistine Chapel all day with Mrs. Bracebridge. Quite alone, without custodian, without visitors looking up into that haven of angels and prophets. There I saw Daniel opening his windows and praying to God three times a day in defiance of fear. Then comes Isaiah, but he's so divine that there's nothing but his own 53rd chapter that will describe him. He's the Isaiah of the comfort ye. Comfort ye, my people. I was rather startled to find him so young, but Michelangelo knew him better. It's the perpetual youth of inspiration that's typed under that youthful face. Oh, no one could have seen the Sistine Chapel without feeling that he has been very near to God. And then England again. Why, Flo, still in bed? I thought we'd go down together to breakfast. Oh, run along, Pothy, and tell Mama I have a headache. I'm so sorry. Uh, can't I get you a powder before I go down? No. Well, you needn't be so cross. All I did was to offer to help. You think you'll be feeling better later on? I doubt it. The trouble is, there's always so much to do and nothing to accomplish. What do you mean? Have I done one thing worth mentioning since I came back from Rome? Well, let me see. You in were... a fortnight, I've read The Daughter at Home to Father. In two chapters of Macintosh, read a volume of Sybil to Mama, learned seven tunes by heart, paid eight visits, done company, and that's all. <laughs> well, isn't that enough? Come on, Flo. I don't think you're sick at all. You just don't want to meet company. Oh, you may be right. If only we lived all year in London. In London, at least you have your mornings free. But here, the round begins in the morning and lasts till night. Flo, Mama is counting on you. Counting on me to what? To smile and laugh and entertain? So that some bigwig will want to come back to Embley and go through the whole round again? But is she counting on me to do anything to relieve the misery all around us? Oh, no. 
All that is carefully removed out of sight, behind the fine old trees to some village three miles off where we won't be bothered. I simply don't understand you. Of course you don't. You float around above the world in some artistic blue heaven all of your own. Well, I'm not trying to drag you down into the chicken yard, my dove. There's too much struggling and scratching there for you. I don't see any need for making personal remarks, Flo. But since you insist, I'll tell you frankly that you're a disappointment to Mama and a dreadful trial to Father. And only our dear, well-behaved eldest is a saint and worthy to be praised. You're being deliberately nasty, and I'll not stay and talk to you a minute longer. Parthy was right. Florence was being deliberately nasty. But she wrote in her diary at the time, I am sick, sick in soul and spirit. Forgive me, Lord, and help me. Bless me, even me also. Oh, my Father. But neither Parthy nor Flo was capable of being angry for very long. So the next time Florence needed some sisterly advice. Parthy? Parthy? Hmm? Oh, come in. What is it, Flo? Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you, shall I wear the white bonnet with this? How lovely you look. By all means, Flo, the white bonnet. Mm, I love that white silk. The flounces are so pretty. I'm wearing the white kid boots, too. Does this need a touch of color? Oh, the pink roses in the bonnet give you color enough for summer. Well, I see you've curled your hair, too. Mama made me promise that I'd learn to do it. And that's the only reason you curled it? Just to please Mama? What are you talking about? Of course that's the only reason. It couldn't be because you're going out to lunch. But don't I always dress up to go to lunch? Well, I just thought you seemed to be taking a bit more care than usual. With whom are you going, Flo? Now, Parthe, you're teasing. <laughs> Couldn't be Mr. Monckton Milne's, would it? And if it is? I'm glad. He's a wonderful man. Brilliant, witty enough even for you, and a very gallant gentleman. All of that means very little to me. <laughs> You're only deceiving yourself when you say that, Flo. Richard has been coming to our house for a long time, but it's plain to see whose company he prefers. He likes to talk politics with Papa, of course. <laughs> of course. And he likes to talk about society to Mama. And if Florence would let him... He'd talk about something ever so much more romantic to her. Admit it, Flo. Oh, bother. And you do like him a bit, too, don't you? Parthe, there's nothing between Mr. Milneys and me. We've just been good friends for a while. But we'll never be more than friends, believe me. Well, Mr. Milneys has... June and soft breezes and blooming flowers in his favor. And I'll tell you frankly, I hope he can turn your sober, serious little head. Now run along and have a glorious time and forget everything but him. And so we conclude Chapter 4 in the transcribed story of Florence Nightingale, The Lady with the Lamp. This is another in the series of stories of great Christians which come to you from the radio studios of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Chicago.